Thank you for joining us today, and I appreciate the time to uh, chat with you about what I think is a, a very important initiative um, on improving the interoperability of files and media. And so, as a background, um, this time last year, the North American Broadcasters Association had an activity on file formats and they realized that it was one of the most important issues that was facing their membership today. And so a series of weekly meetings created an overview of the technology and the problems, investigated the challenges, and conducted some member surveys to develop conclusions and takeaways about how we could move forward. And we produced a report that kind of summarized the results. And what the report really showed was, you know, that the media industry has changed pretty dramatically, and we've gone from linear broadcasters to broadcasters that support multiple means of distribution, and that the linear process would not scale to do that, and so there was a move to file-based workflows, and that required significant changes in infrastructure in the organization. And one of my pet peeves was the flood of delivery specifications. Every year we all write a specification that says, this is the way I want my files delivered. Many of them are ambiguous, including my own. Um, there's not enough specificity in there for people to be absolutely sure that they're producing the correct file and it creates issues. And so NABA took this under advice of the file format working group, produced the report, and the findings of the report showed that there were several issues. It's not just the specification between organizations and what you get for a deliverable. It's also a problem within organizations that many media organizations are quite large. They work in silos and um, people generally know the silo on either side of them. I receive product from this group, I deliver it to that group, but they don't know the whole chain. And so sometimes suboptimal choices are made in picking what they need to do. So. We're moving forward with some courses of actions. Uh, certainly in uh, the UK, the DPP recognized this some, quite some time ago and has made a commitment to and succeeded in producing an excellent uh, set of constraints around the standards, which has been embodied in the um, AS11 specification through AMWA. And so what we decided to focus on was, let's start with the supply side, similar to what DPP did, but we also have to recognize that a similar problem exists on the distribution side. And so we will investigate the possibility of harmonization across the industry. And then there was the standardization of persistent identifiers. One of the key issues is that if the essence doesn't have a persistent identifier associated with it, then it's very hard to keep it associated with the correct metadata set and the full data set in order to properly monetize the content. And that the linkage between the metadata and the data can be broken on a regular basis through many of our workflows. And that creates expense, produces redundant work, and is a real challenge for us. And of course, things like transcoding, many other workflow elements can break uh, the, the uh, binding. And so, you know, one of the things that's going on there is the SMPTE has an open binding working group that is studying how to, Im to improve the binding situation. And then there was a third recommendation, and it was why are we producing documents to be read by human beings and handed off that are slightly ambiguous, why don't we consider another way of publishing a delivery specification? And that means of publishing a delivery specification could be a standardized XML representation of the specifications in detail that most human beings would not tolerate. And that could be used both for processing and verification. So it would be a machine executable string, and think of it as the Internet of Things or machine to machine communications, um, so that you could very specifically not only define it, 
but you could drive the processing and you could drive separate verification equipment from another manufacturer so that you could automate the user file format delivery. And by doing this, we'll certainly improve the deliverables of the process. Um, so, you know, in our organization and in many, the way this typically works today is somebody is assigned the task of creating a, um, a file format specification every year. And so they get out the latest standards updates, they look at the latest equipment that we've installed, et cetera, compile all that information, think about it in great detail, and finally publish a document that they're more or less happy with. And then that goes to a supplier who is blind to the process of the changes we've made in our organization and the updates we've made. And um, so he has to sit down and study it and wonder what we were thinking. And he does wonder a great deal about what we were thinking and finally he gets on the phone or does a sky, uh, Skype or something like that to find out in more detail. And he sits down and interprets that and programs it into a device to make the file that we want made. And a few days later gets called on the carpet for his boss, from his boss, because the customer's unhappy that that file didn't work the way he wanted it to. And the temptation is to go smash the equipment. But eventually, after thinking about it, he thinks better of it, calls in an expert who diagnoses where the problem is in the file, and they declare victory. And this is a heck of an inefficient process to go through every year. And so the report pointed out that there could be improvements in how to do that. You know, the three things that we could do, the harmonization, the persistent identifier, and the XML string. But let's face it, all of that is much bigger than any one organization. And there are a lot of great organizations that are working in this space and doing some fantastic work. And so the decision was made to reach out to industry organizations and create the Joint Task Force on File Formats and Media Interoperability. And we are extremely fortunate at the breadth of this organization. So it is the AMWA, which has done extremely good work in this space with the DPP and others. It's the 4As and the ANAs, which is the first time we've had the advertiser involvement. And they are just as interested as we are in making this process efficient, not just for programs, but for advertising and to get the correct metadata associated with that advertising so that we can make the process efficient and monetize it better. The European Broadcasting Union is participating this in an observer status is the current time, but they are contributing work as well. The International Association of Broadcast Manufacturers, the North American Broadcasters Association, and the SMPTE are all working together. So what are they doing? So, the task force really is a chance for these organizations to discuss how to create greater efficiencies, eliminate ambiguity, and eliminate errors in workflow. And so across all of these organizations, we are gathering data in order to help them understand the challenges that you face. And uh, here is a link to use cases. We have a site where you can go on and put in your use case and it's in a very simple format. And this is a chance, rather than to run around to every standards and technology committee meeting that will take place over the next year, to fill out a form one time and use it to inform the great work that is going on within the SMPTE, the AMWA, the EBU, et cetera. And it's a very simple form to fill in. It takes the role of, as a user, I want to do this business function and create this business value. I can't tell you how critically important it is that we get this information, that we are sure that we are solving the right problems and your contributions will be critically important to us. So the Joint Task Force sponsors we've talked about, we've laid the foundation, we have agreements on terms of reference, scopes, framework, et cetera. We've determined how to work together and make achievements. And now we're starting up the working groups. And we've had a user requirements working group going for some time. And uh, they have been collecting user requirements now for about six weeks. And uh, that's going quite well, but we want to encourage more participation. We have another working group that's just getting started. It's chaired by Chris Lennon. And that working group is uh, documenting the existing practices, uh, standards, and specifications that people have in place. 
Today's transcoders, today's uh, test engines, etc., are driven largely by XML strings or scripts or APIs. And so if we document those practices, there is the possibility that we could create a superset language that could be set as a milestone in the future that we would agree to this standard. But in the meantime, that could be parsed out to drive the devices within your existing workflows today. So be of greater use in the future, but be of immediate use today. And uh, so that's going on. And then we will have a, uh, a report authoring group as well. So the survey goals are certainly to collect the user requirements. That's in progress. Analyze and publish the reports. We'll compare those against our current standards activities. And we'll take a look. We're collecting uh, profiles from manufacturers of how they interface with their devices, how they drive their devices. And we'll be gathering those. And, uh, and then we'll use those in consideration for further work in the task force and further work that is ongoing within st existing standards committees and standards bodies. So the survey started mid-February at the NP N uh, HPA. We anticipated originally that we would uh, probably end it at the end of February. We've had good participation, but it's not as broad participation as we would like to have. And so we're, we're doing an outreach program to get as broad participation as we can. And then we will go into the finish and analyze the data stage, and then we will draft a report. You see here the original schedule. We're at least a month behind all of that. And, uh, but that's why you know, this is a great chance for you to participate now, because you didn't miss the chance to participate then. I do want to say something about the great work that's in progress. Uh, here's a list of activities that's going on. The SMPTE with their IMF work has been working with CPL and OPL, which is closely aligned to this, but not quite. And that could perhaps be harmonized a bit with this work. Uh, the SMPTE is doing the open binding working group, which will give us the persistence of the identifier so we can maintain the relationship with the uh, metadata and the media. AMWA has done wonderful work with AS11 and, and DPP, and there's a chance to extend that work very dramatically to, to solve the problem on a worldwide basis. Um, the DPP file specification and now the work that's going on in DPP on archive will be very valuable and informative, not just to this work, but to the industry in general. EBU has done wonderful work on QC and uh, the QC periodic table and their vocabulary for QC. FIMS is working now on QC service, which will pro incorporate that work and imagine there's the generalized language of QC. And of course, FIMS is working on transform. So I have to ask once again, here's the link. Please go to this site. Please enter your use cases. Again, it's your one chance to avoid all the air travel and all the hotel room stays and talk to a lot of committee people that are doing hard work that would love to have your input on a regular basis. Um, so the Standards and Practices Working Group is, is getting started here at NAB, and they are walking around to vendors. They are finding out how people are driving it. They're investigating possible solutions. And Chris Lennon will be looking for participants from that group. And if you have an interest there, you should contract, contact Chris Lennon. And again, submit your <laughs> use cases because that drives everything. All right.